Thanks very much, Roderick. And uh, first of all, I just also want to make kind of a, a shout out to all the people who are attending uh, these conferences and doing science um, in the face of all the dynamic commitments of home. So not just uh, children running in, but uh, you know, having to do things that uh, you wouldn't otherwise have to do at a conference. So I want to talk today about uh, comparative regulatory genomics and how ENCODE has helped enable um, extensive studies of regulatory evolution. Uh, by technology, uh, both computational and experimental. So one of the things that uh, has been shown is that transcription factor binding sites, when you look across evolution, uh, they change rapidly. And in fact, the change is exponential with evolutionary times. So the drop-off is really very quick. Uh, and this is true. Here's an example of uh, transcription factor binding, CBP alpha in liver. Um, and you can compare this with long branch lengths um, or short branch lengths. And the drop off is actually relatively quick in the transcription factor binding site locations. And, and indeed, um, work from Trey Eidecker's group a few years ago showed that the rates are indistinguishable, regardless of whether you're looking at mammals or insects, embryos or adult tissues, or different factors. This is just a, a common way that uh, transcription factor binding sites change over evolutionary time. They change rapidly. Now, at the same time, gene expression evolves slowly, um, and these changes are essentially linear. Um, this is also from the combined um, analysis that uh, came out of Trey Eidecker's group. Uh, and we can see that we end up in this situation where um, we see an evolution of transcriptional regulation, uh, and multiple things are happening simultaneously. Gene expression levels are evolutionarily stable. Uh, tissue expression profiles are maintained. But at the same time, the tissue-specific transcription factor binding is neither stable nor maintained. So if we are out looking for um, those sites of interest of regulatory regions uh, for doing genome interpretation, we need to take this into account. Um, and trying to understand more of, of, of how we can, we can decide these together and make sense of this ha has been a focus of research uh, in my group over time. So one of the things we showed a few years ago is that uh, in looking across 20 uh, different mammals um, and mapping promoters and enhancers, that conserved regulatory regions are really very rare, uh, and these tend to be promoters. Uh, so if you look from the point of view of human, there's roughly 41,000 human regulatory regions in the way we did the assay. Um, those are um, roughly well, 1,200 promoters and, and 30,000 or 12,000 promoters, 30,000 enhancers. Uh, but of those, um, only about 10 or only about 20% of the promoters are highly conserved, so shared across many species. Uh, but a very small number of these enhancers are highly conserved, uh, only about one tenth of 1%. So this gives something to look at. Um, the other thing that we noticed is across these 20 species, about half of all the active enhancers in liver are found in a given species are found only in that species. And so we called those recently evolved. So the vast majority of, um, when you look across species, the vast majority of the regulome is in this recently evolved category, or the majority of the, the regulome is in the recently evolved category, and only a small amount is in the conserved category. We can look at the origins of these, uh, these various categories, and especially the recently evolved ones. As it turned out, the recently evolved promoters tend to arise from young DNA. Uh, so young DNA here means DNA that's not present in the, uh, the multiple alignment of these species. It's generally added in various places through duplication uh, or in some cases, um, transposable elements. On the other hand, enhancers tend to arise from ancestral DNA. Uh, that is DNA that was present in the multiple sequence alignment, uh, but gets captured in only one of these lineages in an enhancer form. So there's apparently enhancer potential um, in the common ancestor, uh, but it's only being um, instantiated uh, down one of the lineages. Now it's important to note that the scales on these two are, are very different. There's many more of these recently evolved enhancers. There's 10 times as many as the scale. So this means there's actually thousands of, of enhancers that arise from ancestral DNA. And most of those, as you can see, um, or many of those arise, tend to arise from transposable elements, which I think provides a, a very interesting avenue of future research. We spent some time trying to connect these regulatory, the regulatory evolution to gene expression. 
Uh, you can see an example off to the side of, of gene expression and regulatory landscape for 10 species. There's a number of, of characteristics that are required to be addressed in this situation. Um, so we address two of them, which is gene expression level uh, and expression stability. So the expression level is relatively simple. It's, it's how much the gene is expressed. Um, but the stability is, is also important for evolution. It's how variable it is uh, across species. Now these characteristics are confounded. Highly expressed genes are more evolutionarily stable. Of course, the assembly quality, uh, which was a larger concern when we were doing this study than, than it is today as, as more high quality assemblies are being produced, also impacts the analysis. Uh, and we end up, you end up basically seeing that uh, um, we need to take apart these, these details of expression level and expression stability to get at how we can connect uh, regulatory evolution to um, gene expression. And what we found from this um, is that the number of regulatory elements uh, is the primary driver of both expression level and expression stability. Um, what you can see is that the gene expression basically uh, works with promoters as if it's a switch. Uh, from zero to one, the gene expression turns on. There's relatively little additional expression with more promoters. But as enhancers are added, um, the gene expression and indeed gene expression um, stability or the correlation uh, both increase. Uh, and we had to do this. I'm not sure if my pointer here, we had to do this with a um, finding controls in various places that allowed it to, to match um, various gene, uh, gene situations where we would match for expression level uh, with different numbers of promoters, expression level with different numbers of enhancers uh, to determine these results. And this gets back to the point of regulatory complexity. Um, if the number of regulatory regions is the primary driver, then more complex regulatory landscapes, those with more regulatory regions, are um, the ones that are under greater regulatory selection, both from an expression level and from an expression stability point of view. We did look into uh, the effect of evolutionary conservation. Um, and although the primary driver, again, is the number of, of enhancers, those enhancers that are conserved are slightly stronger. Uh, so genes with placental conserved elements are more highly expressed. And here we did this by um, doing a control where we had the same number of enhancers and um, looked at conserved versus non-conserved. And genes with conserved elements are more stable. Um, again, in here we looked at conserved elements and double matched for expression level and number of, of elements. We also show that recently evolved enhancers are slightly weaker. Um, and so again, you can add a recently evolved enhancer and you can see that it does affect the gene expression. It does expect, uh, affect the gene expression stability. So there's quite a bit of evidence that we find from this that at least overall, uh, the recently evolved enhancers are functional um, and they add again to the, the overall regulatory landscape, which leads to expression level and expression stability. We wanted to then investigate uh, some details about how tissue specificity and different tissues come into play. Now, I mentioned earlier that uh, most of these recently evolved enhancers are present in the multiple sequence alignment, suggesting that they had enhancer potential in the ancestral sequence. We hypothesized that what might be happening is that the enhancer potential is being captured in different tissues uh, down different lineages. And so to try to get some insight into this, uh, we mapped regulatory elements in four tissues and 10 species um, and, uh, and, and tried to make sense of, of this. Some of the results that come out of this is the tissue specific regulatory landscape is actually very consistent across species. Uh, you get approximately the same number of active promoters, enhancers and primed enhancers uh, in these four tissues. These four tissues are also quite uh, distinct over time. You will notice some differences in the numbers that we are getting for active promoters and active enhancers. Uh, we sequenced these libraries much deeper and used some different, uh, uh, we, well, we used an additional histone modification in our, our definitions to do this. Uh, but the results are, are largely comparable to the previous ones. So one of the things we see from this is that uh, our initial hypothesis um, uh, well, 
Uh, so the, the initial um, observation of tissue specificity of these regulatory elements does play out. A large promote, portion of promoters um, are active across tissues, but uh, um, the, the vast majority of enhancers are predominantly tissue specific and occur only in one tissue. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the gene expression activity up here in black largely follows the, uh, the pattern of promoters as to how many tissues that they are formed in. Now this is taking from a spe uh, one species at a time um, uh, point of view, even though this is all species summed together. So there's no exact evolutionary analysis here. This is about tissue specificity and tissue shared uh, activity. Well, one of the things we could look at, and this asks the answer or goes some way to answering the question of the hypothesis that, uh, that I suggested, is that um, uh, because there's enhancer and in, uh, ancestral enhancer potential, um, whether or not we can see switching of this regulatory identity um, uh, down over evolutionary time. And the first thing we looked at was how often within a species uh, promoters became enhancers in another tissue. This actually happens relatively rarely. Uh, it's also true that the active enhancers and the primed enhancers switch their roles relatively rarely across these four tissues. I, I think this calls into question some of the um, some of the, the theories that suggest that promoters and enhancers are really on a continuum. They, they look more distinct from this analysis, although obviously there's more to do. Now between species, uh, it's a different story. Regulatory identity changes are common between species. 20% of the promoters change identities uh, and the enhancers and the, the primed enhancers almost look like they're in evolutionary equilibrium. Um, we also found these dynamic promoter enhancers. Uh, these are those up here that uh, switch within a, a given species. Uh, these are not maintained by evolution. We were also looked into some characteristics of these interspecies switchers. Uh, so regions are uh, more likely to switch identity over longer evolutionary time, which I think is, is something that would be expected. Um, we used the fact that we had a nice evolutionary structure with um, two in-group and out-group analysis to estimate directionality of, of our switches. Um, and what we can see from this is that uh, promoters uh, basically tend to stay promoters. Um, and again, we have this kind of dynamic change between the primed enhancers and the active enhancers uh, with enhancers likely to become promoters. We also were able to look at the tissue specific profiles of evolutionarily um, dynamic regions. Uh, and these are less typical than their non-evolutionarily dynamic counterparts. Uh, the promoters that are evolutionary dynamic, so the ones that are changing between species, uh, they are less likely to be tissue shared. Um, and the enhancers that are changing between species to something else are actually more likely to be tissue shared. So finally, um, we looked into uh, some of the things that might be driving this tissue specificity versus this tissue shared versus tissue specific um, axis, as well as the interspecies dynamic regions. Uh, and what we found in both cases is that uh, lines, um, so retrotransposons and line L2s, which are the, the more ancient of the lines, seem to serve as a reservoir of regulatory potential. Um, and this is true both for these, those that are dynamic between tissue shared and, uh, and tissue specific, um, as well as those that are interspecies that change between species. If you have more, uh, if you're interested in this, we do have a preprint up on BioArchive that you can go and take a look at. Uh, and just before I'm done, I, I wanted to kind of make one comment about um, some of the things that, that we can build off of from here and, and, and some of the future opportunities. So one of them is instantiated by a, a group of projects in Europe under the FANG consortium. So that's the functional annotation of animal genomes. It's essentially ENCODE-like analysis um, for uh, farmed species. Uh, the European Commission has funded three interconnected projects, uh, AquaFANG, Bovreg, and GeneSwitch, uh, focusing on aquaculture species, beef and dairy cattle, and chicken and pigs. Um, and the goal of these projects is to generate uh, functional annotation and do comparative genomics across them. And I'll just give you a quick example from AquaFang. Uh, so here are the six species that they're looking at. The goal is to create body maps um, of multiple tissues 
developmental maps um, for these species and immunomaps um, to try to understand um, how, the, um, how these things work together. You'll see from looking at the aquafang assays, these are very familiar uh, to all of us um, who have used and worked in the ENCODE data. Um, and th the types of, of samples that are being looked at are also actually very ambitious. And so to conclude, uh, mammalian tissue regulatory profiles, which we can see from um, doing comparative regulatory genomics are globally similar across species and somatic tissues. Within a species, it turns out to be relatively rare for a regulatory region to change between a promoter and enhancer, but this is a common um, thing across species. L2s appear to be something of a Swiss army knife of regulatory potential and regulatory genomes, and there's a host of exciting opportunities um, for genome interpretation within and across species um, as we move forward. And so finally, just to acknowledge uh, the people that did the work um, and the various results that were presented um, and uh, our funding. So thank you very much. I'm happy to take uh, questions if there are any. Yes. Uh...